Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Eric forgot what time and we got like half a webinar <laughs> before you remember. <laughs> well, let's get a whole webinar this time. <laughs> All right. Yes, well, yes, we, we got the whole are thing. Are you ready going. to get started, Mike? I am always ready, my friend. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar. This is part of an ongoing webinar series exploring the practical applications of culinary medicine, taking it from the classroom to your kitchen. Uh, my name is Brianna Niekamp. I'm the online marketing coordinator at the University of Montana, and I'll be helping facilitate our session today. Just to give you a brief overview of what to expect, um, first I'll introduce our speaker, and then we'll get into exploring the topic of the day, which is all the fun stuff you wanna hear about. Uh, towards the end of the session, we'll open the floor for questions. If you have a question, please enter it in the chat feature icon located at the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to get to all of your questions. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker. He's a cardiologist, professional chef, author, and professor. Uh, please welcome Dr. Michael Fenster. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much once again for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us uh, here today. As Brianna said, uh, I'm Chef Dr. Mike, a cardiologist, a professional chef, and I also teach the culinary medicine course at the university. And if this is something that speaks to you, uh, we've made our graduate level program accessible, amenable, enjoyable for all. Uh, you can go to Chef Dr. Mike, ChefDrMike.com and just click on the little tab that says online courses um, and you can explore, learn about what we're teaching in, in the course. And that course, it really serves to give you all the data and kind of the explanations that we end up talking about on the webinar. So if you're kind of curious as to, wow, that sounds crazy, you know, where's the data for what he's saying? Where did that come from? That's not what I've heard. Uh, the course is a great place to go ahead and get learn that information, uh, satisfy your own curiosity. Uh, the course also comes with a level one certification in culinary medicine uh, from the university. If you're a healthcare professional, there's an option for uh, a whole lot of CMEs, uh, level one CMEs, I might add, if you're a culinary professional, uh, we're in partnership with the American Culinary Federation and they'll give you ACF, CEUs, you can use towards your CEC. Whole lot of acronyms uh, there as well. Uh, and if it, you're someone who just wants to learn and maybe incorporate it into your professional uh, life, then uh, this also offers an accreditation, uh, essentially a digital badge that will explain to uh, potential employers or anyone else who's interested, they can log on through Credly and see exactly the skill set that you learned. So uh, with that behind us today, finally spring. I don't know where you are, what it's been like. Uh, it's been a long, slow, cold, snowbound February here in Montana. And sort of at this time every year, we are ready for spring. The snow is starting to melt. And to me, that always starts to signal some of the freshest plants and the vitality that comes out of the, the garden with those first uh, fresh things of spring. And so that also kind of makes me think a little bit about, you know, getting out using some fresh herbs that we're gonna grow and also using our spices. And while we still have some snow on the ground, you know, spices are something that we can use year round. And we talk about this a lot in our culinary medicine course. There's a whole lecture devoted to it. But you know, one of the important things from a practical uh, standpoint when we talk about culinary medicine is spices are personality, right? You know, and we talk about spicing up your life and and uh, you know, spicy this and spicy that, and and spices really allow you to infuse that meal with your own idiom, as it were. So really, the the spice of a dish is its personality, if you want to think about it in those terms, and. One of the interesting things about spices is if we look at the history of spices, we find that they really mirror sort of the history of humankind throughout the ages. And one of the most important things about spices is that without spices, there would be no pirates. Now, we're, you see the special effects we have here. We spare no expense on this webinar. Um, seriously, though, without spices, 
there really would have been uh, much less in terms of the European power struggle and colonialism that led to the Pirates of the Caribbean. And if you love uh, Johnny Depp as Captain Jack uh, Sparrow as much as I do, you know what I'm talking about here, mates, then um, you know that you love spices because without the spice trade, there would have been no a West India Company. Uh, without the uh, West uh, India Company, there would have been no Pirates of the Caribbean. So one of the most uh, important thing um, that I can think of when it comes to spices. And when we talk about spices, um, what exactly are we talking about? And how are they different from herbs? So in our class, when we break down herbs and spices, we talk about herbs when we're talking about either fresh or dried leaves or stems of plants. The spices have to do with the flowers, the buds, uh, the seeds, and the roots of the plants. And, and uh, very often those are dried, those are ground, and that's when we talk about them as a spice. So today when we're talking about spices, we're, we're talking about really all the parts of different plants that we can use except for the leaves and except for the stems. And very often the question comes up, well, can a plant be both an herb and a spice? And sure, and there's one that's very common that I'm sure you know about, and that's uh, coriander, or as we refer to it often in the United States, cilantro. So we use the fresh leaves, we use the fresh stems uh, very often in Latin American or Mexican cuisine. It's also very popular in some uh, Mediterranean European cuisines and Chinese cuisine as, as well. Uh, but we also use the seed, which you'll know as coriander seed. And in a recipe we're gonna feature today, we actually do use some, some coriander seed. So there's an example of a plant that can be both a spice and an herb uh, at the same time. And one of the questions that comes about um, very often is, well, how did we as human beings come to use spices? Because we usually use them in pretty small amounts relative to eating a salad or having a big protein or having a carbohydrate or starch on our, uh, on our plates. Uh, they're, they're kind of the, as I said, the personality of the food. They're really the bit actors uh, in the dishes that we create. So they, they accentuate, but we don't often consume them isolated and on their own. So how do they come to be a part of these different cuisines? And you'll find a lot of spice usage where it is very warm. So as we get closer and closer to the equator, you see more and more spices used. And so one of the myths that's out there about spices is that we use spices and we use more of them as we get closer to the equator uh, because they cause us to sweat, which when we think of something spicy like a chili pepper can be true. And that helped cool human beings during that, that time before air conditioning down there. And unfortunately, that myth is exactly what it is. It's a myth. Uh, the chilies don't cause you to sweat enough to really alter or affect body temperature. There are a whole lot of spices that are used that have nothing to do with you sweating or not sweating. And in fact, what's very interesting uh, when we look at the study of spices is that we find that their inclusion is really a bit of what we might call Darwinian gastronomy. And so most spices are very, very effective against foodborne pathogens. So the things that would cause us to get sick, food poisoning essentially, if we were to eat foil, uh, spoiled food, that um, is reduced. And many of these, uh, herb, both herbs and spices, are very effective at treating or eliminating or preventing that spoilage. So now we see that it makes sense that as we get closer to the equator where food spoils quicker and quicker, you would use more and more spices to help prevent that food spoilage. And it's thought in the days before written history that human beings that would incorporate this into their food preparations and what they would eat would remain healthier. So if you had a uh, pension and a, a taste for something like black pepper, for example, or something like oregano or thyme, and you'd like to eat foods that contain that, 
that actually helped you stay safer in terms of avoiding getting ill and anybody who's had food poisoning, which I think if you talk to anybody who's been in the food industry at one time or another, we've all had food poisoning from something and, and you will feel like you are on, on death's door. And actually in some cases for certain folks who are at high risk, immunocompromised, uh, pregnant women, very small children, the very elderly, for example, food poisoning, uh, particularly with certain strains of salmonella actually can uh, be lethal can be fatal. So it, that's really where we think our introduction to uh, spices um, really came about. And with our modern methods of food preservation and food safety, the question is, well, you know, we probably don't use them so much in that sense anymore, but do herbs and spices in particular do they still serve a role in terms of helping us with our health? And the very short answer on that is yes. And it's yes in all capitals with an exclamation point. And so some of you may have come across ads for different types of uh, spices to incorporate like turmeric. Uh, some supplements like curcumin are really just a compound that's found in turmeric uh, that's isolated and concentrated and, and uh, put into pill form at, at very high levels. But it turns out that spices really help us maintain health and wellness in a variety of reasons, uh, for a variety of reasons. And so one of the things that spices often have are very powerful antioxidants. So although we can use them in small amounts, many of their compounds are quite powerful. Uh, I don't know how many of you out there are familiar with Dr. Oz, but he's long uh, for example, recommended cinnamon for hypertension. And so when we look at some clinical trials that have been done with incorporating cinnamon, one of our spices, on a regular basis, what we find is it does have a positive effect, for example, on blood pressure. And it can be in the neighborhood of several millimeters of mercury, which believe it or not, is actually on par with single agent hypertensive therapies or the medicines uh, that your physician or other healthcare provider might ask, uh, have prescribed for you to take for conditions like that. So, so that's one of uh, the ways that they have uh, powerful effects. We're talking about incorporating bits of plants that are roots, barks, et cetera. So they contribute fiber, particularly fiber that is good for our gut in one form or another. So that's a probiotic effect to help maintain gut health that as we're learning over the last several years, more and more information coming out, how critical that is at all levels in health. And one of the most interesting, um, and you may not be familiar with this, uh, ways that spices really impact our health for a positive reason is that they contain compounds called bioactives. Now, what is, what is a bioactive? It's what we refer to, um, and these primarily have been all derived from plants. And as I mentioned, a lot of these come from spices. They're often found in herbs as well. And it's not a mineral, it's not a vitamin, it's not an antioxidant. Your body doesn't really use it in that way. But what it is is a unique kind of compound that actually can switch our human genes on and off. And we refer to those as, as bioactives. And exactly how they work can vary from individual to individual and can vary with the compound. But the analogy that I'll give you, and this uh, is actually from uh, our guest lecture, teaches the nutrigenomics portion of our culinary medicine course, uh, Amanda Archibald. And what Amanda says is, you know, if you take antioxidants in, so you're eating your salad and you're, you're getting all the antioxidants from those leafy green vegetables, that's, that's great. Um, but that's sort of like taking um, you know, a garden hose to your body's inflammation process. If that was a big fire, you're kind of just spraying it with positive benefits. We don't want to discount that. But when you take in a bioactive, that's like calling the fire department. And that turns on your own body's antioxidant producing mechanism. So you start manufacturing those powerful antioxidant 
enzymes on your own. And all of a sudden that inflammation fire that's burning you up, you know, you've got the ladder truck, you've got, you know, a couple of the big pumpers, you've got the whole fire department there. So that's why we get very excited about these bioactives. And we get very excited about uh, finding them in our herbs and our spices that we can add to our, our, our dishes. And so really, um, as I spoke early on, these herbs and spices have been developed in, over the centuries, over the millennia in different regions kind of throughout the world. And what they really form are what we refer to in the culinary world as our flavor profiles. And you guys all know this. So if I were to say, hey, let's, and let's do this, let's think about kind of some Italian food. So what kind of flavors do you start thinking about? You start thinking about some garlic, which although, you know, it's a plant and we chop it, we often kind of throw onions and garlic in there with our herbs. Uh, so we start thinking about garlic, we start thinking about oregano, we start thinking about basil being incorporated. Um, you know, if I were to talk about Latin American or Mexican food, you might start thinking about chili peppers. Uh, you might start thinking about cumin and coriander. You might think start thinking about cilantro or coriander, the plant, as we talked about earlier. So what we find is that um, these couple of different, you know, spices, these combinations of herbs and spices really form the basis of flavor profiles. And that really sets the tone, the personality for the dish we're going to create. And by using and varying our flavor profiles, which in essence is just changing the combinations of herbs and spices, we can take a simple protein like, you know, chicken, um, you know, some ground beef, a piece of fish, some shrimp, uh, some butternut squash, um, et cetera. And we can, you know, change completely the food experience. So if I were to take some fish and grill it up and put the, the chili peppers and the cumin and the coriander and the, uh, the cilantro and those types of spices on it, that's going to be very different than if I use some olive oil combined with uh, parsley and thyme, etc. And one of the dishes I want to share with you today, and Brianna is going to put the links up there, so don't worry about scribbling stuff down. Um, it's all there for you on the website. What I'm going to talk to you today about is uh, a, a, a chicken tagine, and that starts with a North African spice blend called Ras Al Hanout. And this is, again, uh, a, kind of a fascinating story just for this spice blend. The name Ras Al Hanout loosely translates as top shelf or literally top of the shelf. And everybody who was a spice merchant had their own blend of this. And so that's one of the other things about using spices and herbs. Make them your own. It's your personality that's going to come out of the dish. You want a little, a little more heat? add chili pepper. You like a little more cumin in there? Go ahead and, and put that in there. And this spice blend was known, actually the, the term Ras in Ras Al Hanout is the title given to Ethiopian king. So this literally was the top shelf. This was the king of the spice blends. Um, and it, it it's absolutely incredibly amazing. And it's good on everything from lamb to fish, uh, to vegetables, uh, you, you can use it all over. And many people think, oh, North African, it's gonna be very spicy, but this really, it, it's not like a, a spicy curry. It has kind of sort of those, kind of those curry undertones to it, but it's, it's much more floral, elegant, um, just brings an incredible structure and color to a dish. And one of the things that you can do is you can make your own and there's a recipe there for using, um, you know, my version, uh, spice blend. And but you can certainly go out from reputable uh, spice dealers and, and buy your own that's already ground and prepared. And as I said, you know, if you want a little more heat, you want a little more ginger, those types of things, a little more cumin, coriander, you can certainly add those, you know, make it your own. You know, the food experience is about what you enjoy. So the spices are the personality there. Infuse it, you know, as you like it. So it's the most delicious thing uh, for, for you. And 
this dish is actually really pretty simple once we go ahead and get our spice blend together. Uh, as I mentioned, the name of the dish is, is called chicken tagine. And Brianna, if you could go ahead and put up the tagine pictures, we'll show you that. And this is a little confusing because the tagine is the vessel uh, that the dish is cooked in. So a tagine is a cooking vessel like a crock pot, like a pot, like a pan. It comes from uh, North Africa is where it originates, but a dish made in a tagine is also called a tagine. So chicken tagine is cooked in a tagine. This recipe, which again, uh, Brianna will put the link up for y'all on the, the chat, is something that if you don't have a tagine, no sweat, don't worry about it, folks very easy. You can do this in any kind of uh, baking dish that you can go ahead and put in an oven as well. Um, very simple. What we do is we do some onions. Uh, we do some chicken. We put that spice on the chicken. You let it marinate so it can really get in there and flavor everything. And then basically you're just going to kind of put this on the tagine, let it cook for several hours, and it's going to be incredibly delicious. Yeah, there's a, a, another picture of it there. And uh, again, and uh, if you can so show the uh, plated pictures of that uh, chicken tagine, uh, Bri uh, Brianna, that'd be great. And so here's the, the dish out of the tagine put on there. And you'll see that I serve this with some couscous and peas. Here's another great use for the uh, Ras Al Hanout spice. If you've ever had couscous and you're getting a little cuckoo because it's like, oh, this is so bland, you know, um, I really, you know, want to change the flavor profile. A great way to spice this up is just to add a little bit of the spice as the couscous steams. You can do the same thing with rice, particularly like a basmati rice. Uh, you could do it over pasta if you want, believe it or not. Um, there's some Middle Eastern influence in some pasta dishes. Absolutely uh, phenomenal. And we give you some tips and tricks to kind of kick this up and to dock it up and elevate it to the next level in terms of using some crispy chicken skin, um, et cetera. But absolutely a phenomenal dish, not hard uh, to do. Um, and um, I wanted to make sure that I leave some time for some uh, questions if folks have any of them uh, in, the, in the chat. Uh, so if you have any questions now, I think Brianna, we've got a couple of minutes and I can take uh, some, some questions from the folks. I think you're muted. Yeah, there you go. All right, so I have uh, one that came in. Um, are things like fresh turmeric or ginger better than dried? Oh, great question. Uh, so yes, they're both spices. I like to have both and it really depends on the application. So there are some instances where you really want to have fresh ginger. Uh, when I'm doing, I do an Indonesian uh, Bali infusion that has uh, turmeric in it. And for that, for example, you want to really only use uh, fresh turmeric uh, root. Uh, you don't really want to use the dried one in the infusion. There are other places where in particular, you really want to use the dried version and not the fresh root. So when I'm making, for example, my Ras Al Hanout spice blend, I want to use uh, fresh spices that I'll toast up. And then I want to use, uh, and I'll grind them myself. And I want to use the dried form of turmeric, which usually comes as a, as, as a fresh dried powder. The same thing with the ginger. And also just a culinary note here, when a recipe calls for fresh root or uh, dried, you can't really substitute them on a one-for-one -one basis. So for example, fresh ginger is much more potent than dry ginger. And if you were to use the same amount of dry ginger to be calls for substituting in fresh ginger, that could really be overpowering. So if you do have a recipe where you can vary and you are either substituting a dried when it calls for fresh or a fresh when it calls for dried, uh, just be careful about the substitutions there. Uh, they're often not one for one. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, we have another question. Oh, sure. uh, I have Great. heard of toasting spices. What does that mean? Oh, great question. Um, you often see this. 
And there are certain types of spices. So for example, particularly, I like to touch cumin and coriander. Um, it's it's gonna, it's, it's one of these chef's secrets. So here's a practical culinary medicine chef's secret to, you know, up your culinary game. Um, things like coriander and as I mentioned, cumin in, in particular, anise is another one. Uh, you can toast them. And the way to do that is just to heat up a saute pan. Do not put any oil in you, unless the recipe calls for it. You don't want oil in the pan. Uh, put it over a low medium heat and you'll start to smell the uh, the, the spices will kind of start to give off a, a real pungent aroma. And at that point, you want to pull it off the heat because they will continue to, to cook and go ahead and get them out of the pan. And what you're doing there is you're heating it up and that's releasing a lot of what we call the volatile oils there. And it's going to add a whole nother depth uh, to whatever spice blend or the spices that you're using in the recipe. Another trick uh, or tip with that is that you can do the same thing with pine nuts. Um, I often use them in a pesto and I'll love that the toasty notes of a toasted pine nuts uh, and the same thing applies. Just be really careful. You have to stay on top of it uh, at your stove because they can really go from toasty to burnt uh, in no time at all. And if if they're burnt, you just want to dump them out of the pan. Don't try to use them. It'll, it'll make whatever you're cooking just awful. But but yeah, that's that's a se chef's secret to kind of taking your flavor profile to the next level. Great. I think we have time for one more question. Um, okay. What are your thoughts on pre-done spice blends? Ah, ooh, uh, great, 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 great question. Okay, so um, obviously what I recommend is you buy whole spices, which is like cumin, coriander, anise in the seed form. That will last, you know, a good long time on, on your spice rack if you keep it out of direct sunlight, store them like potatoes and onions, kind of out of direct sunlight in a, in a cool place, a pantry or a cabinet. And um then you can grind them or toast them and grind them uh, as you need them. Once you ground them into a powder or you buy a powder, uh, the shelf life of that is much less, just a couple of months usually, uh, particularly if they're sealed. When you are buying spice blends, and I include chili powder in this, believe it or not, uh, most people, you know, use it and, and <clears throat> depending on the vendor, excuse me, you want to make sure you get it from a great vendor, you know it's organic, and you know that you're getting, <clears throat> excuse me, the spices, uh, because particularly in things like chili powder, they'll include the stems, uh, the bits of the dried membrane in there, stuff that you don't really want that's cheap filler. So um, I generally try to stay away from the pre-done blends uh, unless I, I know the, the vendor is very uh, reputable and I've kind of checked them out online. That's great. Well, I think we're just about out of time. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Mike, do you have any final thoughts before we close out? Uh, thanks so much for taking the time out of your schedules to come here today. Um, I, I, I'm delighted. I, I love doing these. I love the enthusiasm we have. If you have any questions that didn't get answered, just go to chefdrmike.com, chefdrmike.com, uh, and drop us a line, and I will get uh, back uh, to you with an answer. Uh, also, if you don't already, follow us on social media so you know about all the happenings. Lots of exciting stuff going on. Uh, and always, uh, if it speaks to you, if it calls to you, please check out our online course. I'd love to see you in class. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.